morning and welcome to Lifestyle Gardening. I'm Kim Todd and we have another great half hour of good gardening for you today. We'll be taking a look at how to get children interested in gardening as well as giving you some tips for transplanting those tomatoes you've started indoors. Later on we'll show you how you can turn your hydrangeas to a wonderful deep blue color, but first we'd like to take you to the garden center. Last week we gave you some ideas on selecting colorful plants for the upcoming season, so today we'd like to focus on getting around that garden center to find products you're going to need when spring finally gets here. With spring right around the corner, veteran gardeners and new gardeners alike can really be overwhelmed by going into the garden centers. First off, there are all sorts of new products available, and if they are not organized properly, you might end up in a section where you really don't have a clue what's going on. The good garden centers, however, are going to organize based on putting what you want to grow with what you're going to need to grow it with. So for example, let's start talking about seed starting. Many gardeners like to start their seeds inside this time of year. You're going to need grow lights, the right kind of potting mix, which is typically sterile, certainly some great seeds, and any good gardener also knows you darn well better label that, or you're going to forget what is coming out of the ground. And then of course you have all of those wonderful seeds from which to choose, typically organized by vendor. So if you're after botanicals or seed savers or something that is a local product, you don't have to paw through all of the seed bins to be able to find exactly what you're looking for. You might not be interested in growing your own vegetables and flowers in your landscape, but chances are you have a bitty patch of turf, whether it's for your dog, your cats, your kids, or just because you enjoy that lush green carpet, take a look in the garden centers at the locations where the seed is located. And what you can find is everything from the right type of seed mix for your particular conditions, to the mulches that are going to be necessary to be able to keep that seed moist and cool as it germinates, to the kinds of products it will take to keep it healthy during the growing season. That can be everything from fertilizers to fungicides to insecticides and pesticides, depending on what you're after in your own home lawn. You don't necessarily have to use all those products. You can just mow it and enjoy what you get coming up out of your turf in the landscape, but if you do want to, take a look at how those things are organized in a good garden center. You've got your seedlings up and growing and that turf is out of the ground, and now you're into the gardening season, and you need to figure out how to keep those plants lush and lively. So another way to go through the garden center to look for what you need is to concentrate on the places where the products are available. If you look at fertilizers, you need additives, you want to go for organic products, and there is a way bigger line on the market than there used to be. If you have insect problems or pest problems, those are typically going to be organized all in the same section. You want to start your search for those kinds of products, however, by truly understanding the kinds of issues you're dealing with in your own situation, and that will be through observation, through talking to a professional, through contacting Extension if you have particular questions you want answered, and then go ahead and go to that section, take a look for the right thing on the right label. And if you take a look at the products, you might have something like Holly Tone, which is an evergreen and azalea food. That is not going to work for tomatoes. If you want to be very organic or touch the earth lightly with things like a pesticide or an insecticide, you might want to go ahead and look for neem oil. Make sure you do understand, however, that a product that is good for one thing is not necessarily going to be the right product for something else. So take a look at everything available in the section. Make sure you know which plant you're working with. Ask the right questions of the right people. Read the label and take a look at all the products available to you to keep your plants healthy. It's hard to garden without the right gardening tools, and of course, plants cannot survive without the right amount of water applied with the right tool at the right time. So even if you have an automatic irrigation system, chances are you're going to find yourself in the section of the garden center that has watering wands and sprinklers and hoses. The beauty of these tools is that you can hand select for the way you want to apply water to your landscape. They come in an array of colors now, so you can actually match your gardening equipment to your garden. More importantly, if you lay them down in the turf, you're going to be able to find them again later. 
In addition to watering tools, garden centers are going to have their pruning tools arranged in locations where you can pick them easily. Same thing with rakes and hoes and shovels and picks and sprayers, all those sorts of tools that make gardening both easier, more efficient, and a whole lot more fun. So take a hike to the garden center, figure out what it is you need for your particular gardening needs, talk to the right people, read the labels, and be ready to garden this year. Good gardeners know that preparation is key to having green turf, colorful ornamentals, and healthy trees. Visiting with your local garden center professional about your plans is the first step to success. And you never know what you'll find visiting the store. New tools, new plants, and safer chemicals to help control the occasional problems that come up during the season. For our second feature today, we're going to return to the topic of tomatoes. In previous episodes of Lifestyle Gardening, we've helped you pick out the right varieties and get them started and showed you a few typical diseases and how to control them. Right now, we're going to hear about transplanting those plants you started indoors. Here's UNL horticulture graduate student Josh Reznicek to tell us more. So when starting seeds for tomatoes indoors, purchasing them from any retail store, uh, you're going to have to pay attention closely to the description on the packet of seeds uh, specifically. Each seed type is going to have a different requirements for seeding depth, moisture content, and even time of the year for seeding. So knowing what you have or what you're going to grow will be dependent on your process getting started in the beginning of the season. Yeah, the information on the seed pack will include time of year for seeding indoors as well as direct seeding outside on most packets, as well as seeding depth and percent germination, how many you can expect to germinate when seeding a select number of plants, uh, as well as some more descriptive information about the plant, the time to maturity, the time to fruiting, uh, sun requirements, shade requirements, and then as well as moisture requirements too. So transplanting your tomatoes in the greenhouse or inside into a larger container, you're going to be using more of a potting mix than a seed germination mix as your plants get larger. The seed germination mix is a very fine particulate mix. Uh, it allows for free draining and not that great of pore space which smaller plants and seed conditions require. As you bump up, you want something with a little bit more water holding capabilities, a lot more pore space as well, so your potting mixes are desirable. You're going to be making a small divot or, or hole to be able to transplant your plant into. Usually about an inch or so below the first true leaves is ideal. Uh, you can bury tomato plants a little bit more than you would expect you could. Uh, they're very adventitious rooters, so they're going to throw roots off their main stem. So it's actually advised to bury them a little bit, not all the way to the top by any means, but so that way they can have a larger root mass in that media. When transplanting from a smaller container, say a six pack into a larger gallon pod or two gallon pot, uh, loosening up the root material is advised. Uh, sometimes in those small six packs or anything like that you get from a garden center, or even your own indoors, they'll start circling roots. So loosening up those roots, breaking up that circling pattern so it doesn't constrict itself will be better in the long run, a healthier plant, and it'll actually root out a lot better in the future. After transplanting, watering is very essential. It's When transplanting, you don't want to pack the soil or media around the transplant. What you're going to do is remove all the air space or pore space around that root mass, not allowing water to get to the roots. When you want to firm the soil so that way it su supports the plant, but when you water directly after transplanting, what that's going to do is going to settle the plant into that media and take care of that packing sort of thought process instead of you physically doing it. So then that way you're also getting water to the plant as well as providing extra support to it. Usually it's about a month or just ver give or take around there. Your plants are going to be anywhere from six to eight inches tall, maybe even higher, maybe a little bit shorter depending on the variety of the plant. When that time comes, you're going to have to be timing for frost-free zone 
in your local area. So dating back is when you're going to have to start seeding indoors for that. So it becomes a timing game to when you're frost free in your zone. At that point then moving them outside, it's tough on the plants to do it directly, moving them from inside to outside. So hardening them off is preferred. So you start one day with a couple hours outside in natural light and wind and um, it might be cloudy, it might be sunny and then you move them back in after a couple hours and then every other day or every day you extend that time greater and greater so that way by the end before you transplant they're used to the outdoor environmental conditions instead of you throwing them outside and shocking the plants. At some point you're going to have to transplant those seedlings into bigger containers as well as get them outdoors for a period of time before you can plant them in the garden. We do hope these tips will get your tomato plants off to the right start and eventually get you those delicious tomatoes for your diet, whether it be for sauces, sandwiches, or salads. Those cute little squirrels out frolicking in your yard, they can cause some serious damage to your trees and other woody plants in your landscape, and even to your home if they're feeling squirrely enough. For this week's landscape lesson, Extension Wildlife Specialist Dennis Ferraro will show us the kind of damage squirrels can do and what we can do about it. You may see some damage such as this on a tree, a base of a tree, just small chip marks that you see a couple new ones every day. What this is, is tree squirrel marking. Tree squirrels like to mark their territory, especially in trees that have nests or trees that may have food supply. And what they'll do is mark the base of the tree or even someplace higher on the tree. And they also may mark your garage door, your deck, your picnic table. But what they do is they chip it with their teeth and then rub their chin there to leave a scent. And this is telling the other squirrels, this is my territory, back off. It's like squirrel graffiti. Now, the way to stop this function is you could paint a deterrent on this that would burn their lips such as vegetable oil and cayenne pepper or some commercial product that's supposed to be a repellent. And you rub that on here or paint it on the tree or your deck or your garage door and it helps stop that kind of damage. Some other damage that's more severe that you get from tree squirrels is when they actually strip part of the tree. It's usually the smaller branches that are up higher and what happens they'll rip off a decent portion of this when it's very dry to get moisture or to get some micronutrients or some nutrients. When they do that, the repellents usually don't work and it's actually more severe to the tree because if they strip that whole branch around in a circle, then that branch will die. So in those cases, you have to go to trapping the squirrel or the culprit. Now you don't have to trap all the squirrels in your yard. There's probably just one or two tree squirrels actually doing that stripping or marking the tree. If you're going to trap them, you use a box trap. You can use bait such as walnuts. You can put a piece of dry corn on the cob that's with some peanut butter on it. All these things are very easily attractive to squirrels. You'll catch them in the box, usually overnight. Once you catch them, you cannot translocate them. Okay, so you can't bring them to someone else's property or let it go. You can translocate them about 100 yards away and maybe they won't come back because they're so disturbed about being trapped. The other thing is you can call animal control, have them euthanized, or you can use our NEB guide and it tells you some different euthanization processes that are legal. Can't shoot them in the city limits, but you can trap them and remove them if they're causing problems. If they're coming to these areas, you definitely want to use that paint, things like that with that vegetable oil or that repellent, they'll stop this. If they're on your house, use that vegetable oil. Just remember, tree squirrels have been around with trees forever. Most of the time they won't do enough damage to kill the tree, but they can cause some unsightliness to the tree or to your home. So take care of the problem. And if you need more information, check out our NEV guide on tree squirrels. As Dennis said, squirrels are pretty much here to stay. But if you follow his recommendations, you'll have a good chance at keeping them off your valued trees or away from the wood on your home. Hydrangeas can add so much to just about any landscape. 
They come in a variety of shapes and sizes, and their blooms are spectacular. There are a few color variances between varieties, but there is a way to turn some of the pink ones to a deep blue. In this segment, we take a look at how you can do this with the help of aluminum sulfate. The big leaf hydrangeas are the ones that give us these incredible pink and blue flowers. They also bloom on both new wood and old wood if you manage them properly. What I want to talk about today is how you can actually turn the pink blue, or at least keep it blue, it's not really difficult, but it does require some management. The best thing you can use to be able to turn the pink blue or to keep it blue is aluminum sulfate. And it is the aluminum that the hydrangeas require to actually create the blue color. There are a couple of ways to be able to uh, apply that to hydrangeas. One of them is granular and the other is liquid. The granular solutions essentially, if you put them down around the base of the plant once in the spring, and once in the fall, that should create this incredible blue color. You can also use the liquid formulation that has to be typically at a higher strength. It also oftentimes needs to be both a drench and a foliar drench to be able to work properly. The aluminum sulfate in the granular form is typically the one that is most widely available and seems to really give us the best results. The other issue though with keeping the blue blue as opposed to getting the uh, kind of the return to the pink is you want to make sure that you do not apply a phosphate fertilizer. That will actually sort of uh, create a situation where the aluminum really doesn't work as well to be able to create the beautiful blue color in the hydrangeas. These are not particularly difficult plants to grow, but they also don't necessarily bloom the way that you might find them in the nursery. And they, that again has to do with both the situation in which they're planted as well as how they're pruned and of course the conditions of the environment. Whether it is too cold in the winter, too hot in the summer, oftentimes you won't get this incredible large numbers of flowers on a single plant. So make sure you have the aluminum sulfate on hand if you want to create the blue in the hydrangeas. This is the one called Twist and Shout and you can see that it has both the sterile flowers that are a little bit pink as they fade, and then of course the blue ones as they emerge. As with any chemical additive, you'll want to read the product label thoroughly for application rates and other safety information. Used correctly, you'll be amazed at the wonderful color these plants provide. This is the last lifestyle program this season, but we're still taking your emailed questions and pictures for the Backyard Farmer program. That address is byf at unl.edu. Our first two questions come from Broadwater, Nebraska, which is way out west, and they're both tree related. And the first one is our viewer has a hackberry that they planted as a replacement for another tree that died. It's a pretty young one. And it's a pruning question. He's wondering whether he needs to take off a branch that appears as though it is a little bit out of scale with the rest of the tree, kind of pointing in, in a, a broad, wide direction. First off, remember that anytime we make a pruning cut in the landscape, you're removing resources from that tree that will help it photosynthesize. So we really want to be cautious in taking too much foliage or too many branches off a young tree. That said, you also want to keep those lower branches from reaching up into the canopy when they're young, and you want to make sure you do that when you can make the smallest possible pruning cut. So I think what I would recommend on this one is go ahead and reduce the length of that side branch this first year, making the pruning cut properly and taking about a third to a half of that branch off. Then next year you can take that branch off outside the collar and the ridge at the trunk. The second question from this Broadwater viewer has to do with peach trees and what it's going to take to get a, a peach tree to actually produce in that location of the state. And I'll, I'll start off by saying peaches across the state of Nebraska can be a real challenge for good gardeners as well as beginning gardeners. Depending on the season, depending on the variety of peach that you're growing, and of course the, the winter conditions, especially these ups and downs or early and late spring freezes or even late fall conditions that can really impact the flowering capability of the peach. 
So what I would do on that one again is keep that tree as healthy as possible. Don't do any pruning now because the pruning window is closed and you'll remove some of those uh, flowering branches. Make sure that you know which variety that is and if necessary do some wind protection with windbreak. Even, even do uh, in this particular instance maybe a screen that would be a burlap screen if you have a real problem with west-southwest winds. Then you cross your fingers and hope that flowering occurs at a time when you're not going to have those late spring uh, freezes. Our third question is all the way back across the state uh, at Papillion. And this is a question about moles in the, in the lawn, only it's not moles. This viewer, now that the snow is finally gone and they've, the weather is maybe straightened out a little bit enough to be able to go outside, they're seeing all of these interesting trails that appear to start with holes in the ground and then here comes this trail. And they're, they're thinking it's moles that are actually eating the turf. Our critter creature, Dennis Ferraro, would say immediately, not moles, but voles. And what this viewer is looking at is their surface trails that they have created as they run around underneath the, the cover of the snow seeking their food sources. So uh, the viewer also said that they are close to some empty lots or some lots that are, you know, have some brush and some things like that on them. Classic location for the voles to move into the landscape. They're fairly easy to trap, and you have a couple of choices on that. One would be a classic mouse kill spring trap with, with the piece that snaps shut pointing toward the trail and the trap itself set perpendicular to the trail. And the second is a catch trap or a box trap that you bait just a bit and then all those voles run into it and you can dispose of them. But it certainly is a critter that can do a lot of damage, especially in turf, depending on the year. We have an Alliance viewer that got, um, sounds like maybe a bit antsy about spring arriving, and they discovered that one of their stores already had onion sets for sale, so they went ahead and bought some, some onion sets, and we're hoping to get them in the ground, and then of course we've had one more late blast of, of winter, and those onion sets have begun to sprout. Their question is whether it's too late. Have they, you know, what do they do about these sprouted onions? And our reply would be a couple of things. First off, the ground temperature is probably not nearly warm enough to allow you to plant onions, even though you can put them in the ground pretty early. Maybe also too wet, a little bit too cold. We could still get an awful lot of snow and some blizzardy conditions because, of course, we haven't had boys or girls basketball yet in Nebraska, and that's the last blizzard of the season. But these also are already showing a lot of green growth on the top. One thing you might want to consider is go ahead and plant them inside and see if you can keep them going and thriving and get sort of a forced inside onion crop. But if the bulbs themselves have gotten light and, and thin, that means that they've really exhausted themselves in pushing up that top. Chances are you may have to start over once it's time to really put them in the ground. Many of us inherited our love of gardening from our parents, and most of us have fond memories of growing our own food right in the backyard. Gardening can be a fun activity for your kids, and it helps teach them about where food comes from and about the environment. For our last feature today, we head back to the Garden Center to take a look at some products for children to use in their own garden spaces. If I were a betting person, I'd bet that almost every single person who gardens probably started when they were a kid. It might have been something as simple as putting a, a few radish seeds in the ground. It might have been going to a farmer's market with your parents or picking those peas straight out of the garden and then just chomping them down. Might have gone all the way back to playing in the dirt, if you will, with a stick and a sand pile and a little bit of a paper cup or something to shovel with. No matter the reason, if you start gardening as a child, the chances are it'll be something you'll keep with you for the rest of your life. And if you look now at the things that are available to children to garden with, who wouldn't want to be able to get their kids involved in gardening? Think in terms of how we as adults love color in the landscape. We like bright colors to cheer us up on those dull days. We all have color preferences. We choose our landscape plants and our flowers based on the kinds of colors we want. 
We think in terms of antioxidants in our, our vegetables and fruits, and the more color, the better it is for us, and sometimes the better it tastes as well. So if you look at what you could get for your children to be able to use in their own little garden plot, we have everything from shovels to sweep nets to little tiny rakes, umbrellas or shade parasols, children's gloves for little bitty hands so that they don't get way too dirty, although getting your hands in the dirt is a lot of fun when you're a kid, but certainly don't get into things that can either be stickery or cause some sort of a reaction. We have uh, adornments for the garden whether it be steel dragonflies, and if you're lucky enough to have a pond or your child has a puddle to play in, talking about how that dragonfly skims the surface of the water and does all sorts of pollination is a great idea as well. Children love to play in the water, they love to water, and of course in their own little garden patch that might be a bit of a problem because so many of the plants that we would suggest that they try might not necessarily need as much water as they want to give them. That said, what fun it is to sprinkle with something like a Grub Scout sprinkler. You can run through it, you can water with it. It looks like those worms. There's another teaching opportunity there. Or to even use something like a duck or a pig to be able to put water on individual plants. We also have great little garden tool sets for kids. And again, if they're not digging with a wooden spoon, to be able to have their own gardening equipment, their own trowels, makes it all that much more exciting for them. If you add to their own little garden plot with their own tools and then help them choose the seeds that they really want to plant, as opposed to the things that you want to have them plant, chances are they will not only enjoy it more, but you will get great pleasure out of watching them tilling their own soil, digging for their own worms, harvesting if indeed they are able to harvest anything at all from the garden, and simply enjoying the fact that they are outside, not only uh, loving that fresh air and that sunshine, but learning a little bit about how the food they're going to eat comes from the soil that they've tilled and the management practices that they have started when they were little bitty kids. In addition to soil and sticks, these fun items are a sure way to get your kids interested in gardening. With them, they'll be able to catch their own insects and perhaps grow vegetables. And it's a great way to spend time with your family doing something everybody will appreciate. We've had a great time this winter bringing you lifestyle gardening. We hope you'll have a great spring when it will be time to get things planted and everything turns green. Be sure to tune in to Backyard Farmer Tuesday nights here on NET during the growing season. So good morning, good gardening, and thanks for watching Lifestyle Gardening.